Well, we have one scripture. It's Isaiah 43. Remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? One more time. Remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? This is the word of the Lord. Well, it's the first Sunday of the new year, and it's the same old, same old God doing something new in our lives. I mean, this is what he's always up to. He wants to create a new you. He wants a new touch of God to move through you to others. He wants all of us to discover a fresh, new application of his grace and and power in our lives. And inevitably, when I'll I'll say to somebody, hey, what's your New Year's resolutions? And they'll say, well, I I don't make New Year's resolutions. And, And to be fair, this is an ancient Babylonian custom. But surprisingly, Uh, 60% of Americans make New Year's resolutions. This is a higher percentage of people who vote for the presidential election. This is more people than are married in the United States of America, okay? There's a lot of people making resolutions, but sadly only 8% of them are successful at keeping their resolutions. You know, this one man called his parents on New Year's day, and he says, dad picks up, he goes, dad, what's your New Year's resolution? His dad says, well, to make your mother as happy as I can all year long. Then mom jumps on the phone, and he goes, mom, what's your New Year's resolution? And she said, to see to it that your dad keeps his resolution. (laughs) Now, I always make New Year's resolutions because I I follow the, the advice of Oliver Cromwell, the protector of the Commonwealth in England back in the 1600s. He said, if you cease to be better, you cease to be good. And and 2 Corinthians 5, excuse me, yeah, 17, we're a new creation. Old things have passed, new things have come. And, And I want you to know that when you invite Jesus into your life, this is something that happens. Your identity the moment you invite Jesus into your life, changes. You go from not being part of the family of God to becoming a daughter and son of the living God. The moment you invite Jesus in, your identity transforms. However, it's something that continues to occur as you walk with God. You know, our thinking patterns, our our, our lifestyle, our crisis management, our interaction with other people, it's all impacted because a new you is underway. And sometimes the problem is this. We keep looking backwards to our past. We keep holding on to our faults and failures. We keep remembering all the things that have gone wrong, and so we don't reach forward to what new things God wants to do in our life because we're looking at our old life. Friends, he forgave and forgot all the things from your past. A new things available to you. Well, <clears throat> sometimes we have to practice stepping into to this new life, this new identity that Jesus gives us. Uh, Pastor Bill's son <clears throat> co-created an, a new Star Wars video game. And, and you have to understand that when you're a Jedi, you have the Force with you. Okay? And this Force enables you to overcome any evil obstacle with just a wave of the hand. And as Pastor Bill confessed on Christmas Eve to 2,300 people, he now plays video games. And he was telling me that, you know, he's playing his games and, you know, he's using his weapons and his escape strategies and, you know, all of his, his natural skills, forgetting that as a Jedi Knight, he has the force that all he has to do is make one move to overcome all the enemies. And I wonder how many Christians operate this way. We rely on our own strength when we have the power of God available to us to handle whatever situation it is. It's like the story in the Old Testament when Elisha the prophet 
you know, he would tell the king of Israel, hey, you know, your enemies are going to attack you in this way. Your enemies are going to come at you that way. Your enemies are going to move the other way. And so the enemy's saying, now, how come he knows everything about me? Well, Elisha the prophet, he's always telling, he tells him what you do in your bedroom. So the king says, I'm going to go get Elisha the prophet. So he surrounds the town that Elisha the prophet's in. And so his servant comes in, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? The army's here. The army's here. And he just says, there's more with us than are with him. Open the eyes of my servant, Lord. And all of a sudden, the servant sees the armies, the chariots of fire surrounding, you know, the, the whole city where Elisha is. And, and friends, I bring this up because you and I have the opportunity. Listen to 2 Peter 1.3. His divine power has been granted to us. Just feel that a moment. His divine power has been granted to us. 2 Peter 1.4, we participate in the divine nature. So do you see what God has made available to us? The ability to overcome whatever it is that gets thrown in our path. And as all of us step into 2020, I'm anticipating that if you're a Christian, you're hoping for some spiritual transformation. And as you start on this journey, it's crucial to know who you are already. And apparently, I think it's also important that you take into account who you're not. Um, <clears throat> Henry Nouwen presented what he called the five lies of identity. The first is, I am what I have. You know, and <clears throat> in our culture, we are materialistic and we want to have this, that, and the other. And so, you know, we, we measure our lives in terms of do we have the right zip code, the right car, the right <clears throat> clothing, do we have what the right stuff. The problem is stuff. It gets old, it gets outdated, it gets stolen, you know, things go wrong in our lives. And if you're identifying yourself with your stuff, well, you know, that's going to be transient. Some, it could be, I am what I do. We live in a resume. Show me your resume culture, okay? But if you lose your job or you retire and you're not that person anymore and that was your whole identity, guess what? Who are you now? I am what other people say or think of me. Now, the last thing you want to do is let your coworkers, your neighbors, your social media followers, even those who have pledged their allegiance and love towards you, define your identity. Because at the end of the day, uh, those people don't know who you really are. And by the way, most of those people have their own selfish agendas and their own dysfunction. They're the last people that you should be allowing to identify, excuse me, uh, embrace your identity. Another thing that we do wrong, we say, I'm nothing more than my worst moment. I can't tell you how many people can point back to a long time ago when they made a big mistake in life, and they've kind of dropped anchor there and say, this is who I am. No, that was your worst moment in life, okay? That doesn't mean you, at the center of your being, are a grievous mistake. It just means you made a mistake. You've grown. You've moved on. The Lord's probably waiting for you to figure out you've been forgiven. It's time to go forward together. And by the way, uh, you know, it, I am nothing less than my best moment. You know how we put the highlight reel on our Facebook posts about how exciting our lives are? I'm not falling for it, okay? All of us are struggling, trying to figure it out. And yeah, we have some cool moments, but, but, but that, that's not who we are. And, and if we're incapable of accurately discerning our own value, and for sure we don't want to give other people the power to define our lives, how do we know what our true identity is? Well, St. Francis of Assisi said, I am who I am in the sight of God. Nothing more, nothing less. You are who you are based on what God says about you. And how do we know who we are in the sight of the Lord? Well, in Ephesians chapter 1, <clears throat> it's basically one long run-on sentence, okay? This is what he says. All who've abandoned themselves to Jesus have been blessed, chosen, predestined, spiritually adopted, redeemed, forgiven, included into the family, sealed by the Holy Spirit. And by the way, predestined means God knew you and loved you even before you were you. It's pretty intense. God loved you before you even got started. And this means that there are going to be moments where everything in your world falls apart, but you don't have to be one of those things that falls apart. We know our identity, okay? God says so. He's your designer. You belong to him. He says you're good. He says you're mine. He says I've got you. 
He says you're valuable. Guess what? The number one, the first New Year's resolution that I want to give to you is embrace your identity based on God's opinion of you. Well, a New Year's resolution is basically trying to take control of our lives. And taking control of our lives, that's where it becomes a little bit of a problem. I came across this book on self-delusion. You are not so smart. And it points out a number of everyday objects that provide the illusion that we have control, but in reality, they're just props. For instance, take the closed door button on the elevator. It is estimated that 80% of those buttons do not work. So all of us, we're in a hurry, we're hitting the button. It's going to close when it's going to close. You hitting the button has nothing to do with when the door is going to close. Let's move on to the push button at the walk across the street signal. (laughs) The moment that the stoplight sequences became fully automated, those buttons really have no value. It's going to change according to the time frame that's been implanted into the whole system. And the only thing it does is make you feel like you have some control and give you something to do while you're waiting. Then there's the office thermostat. (laughs) Guess what? It's estimated that 50 to 90% of the thermostats in the office are phony. Do you think that the boss is going to let the the employees figure out what temperature when somebody's always freezing and somebody's always hot? I mean, you can't get two people who are married to come to the same consensus about (laughs) what the temperature ought to be in the room. And these disabled thermostats on the wall, they give you the illusion that people can do something about their environment. But I'd like to just suggest that you can do something about your environment. And instead of being a human thermometer, you can be a thermostat. What's the difference? A thermometer, it's passive. Okay, it reacts to what's happening in the room. If people are freaking out in your family or at work, a human thermometer freaks out too. But a thermostat, on the other hand, these things are active. A functioning thermostat sets the tone and regulates the environment. It brings the atmosphere back to where it should be. And when things get hot in your office or or in your family room because of stress and impending crises, thermostat people know how to cool things down. This non-anxious presence, it doesn't respond to the chaos of the moment. In fact, there's a Bible verse. It's called the thermostat text in the scriptures. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So the Lord knows how to keep us in that spot. So resolution number two for the new year is I would suggest you be a thermostat wherever you go and you set the atmosphere. Well, well, how can I do this? Walk in the Spirit. When you walk by the Spirit, this is what happens. The Lord Jesus' agenda is laid out within you and before you. And so now wherever you go, you can even view your daily obstacles as transcendent opportunities to engage God. And by the way, engaging God, this is our privilege. It's our expectation that you and I are going to embrace the God who loves us, died for us, is in our lives. He wants to move. Jesus says a sparrow doesn't fall to the ground without the Heavenly Father knowing. And then realize how intimately involved in your life he already is. Yes, friends, you have the power of God available to you. And I'd like to suggest that this power gets applied to the one commandment that God gave us, the Lord Jesus gave us, love one another as I have loved you. You know, this New Year's Eve, I took my wife to the beach, and we decided to go to St. Petersburg, you know, with the cafes and the art galleries and the museums. And as we were starting our way there, this homeless guy is on the road, and he holds up a sign you know, give me money for food. God bless you. And um, my wife says, um, <clears throat> give him some money. So, uh, well, you know, I don't have any money except 
in the ashtray of the car. I always keep a five there so when we go to the car wash, I can give the tip to the guy. I can't tell you how many times I go to the car wash, I don't have a tip, I feel bad. So I strategize to make sure that in my ashtray is the tip for the guy that washes my car. I said, we don't have any money in the car. So the Lord kind of leans in on me. So let me get this straight. You're lying to your wife and you're not taking care of the poor. So we go to St. Petersburg and there's another homeless guy coming right towards me. And I'm thinking, oh yeah, this guy's getting the money, okay? I gotta get this off my conscience. And so he comes walking up to me and he's eating his sandwich and he's dribbling it all over himself and he comes up to me, hey Whitey, I need three dollars, make it five, okay? So I'm laughing, like, look at this, you know? I would usually be offended, but I'm so happy to give this guy a five, you know? Because, you know, I want to get this right. And here's my whole point of this dumb story. (laughs) The whole encounter with this other guy was actually an encounter between me and God, okay? It was all about me and the Lord having a conversation, the expectation that I care for people around me, that I don't hoard, that when I have it, I freely give, that I respond to the, to the impulse of, 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 of sharing and <clears throat> what my wife tells me to do, okay? These things are important. And so for me, one of the New Year's resolutions is, is, is that I love others better. You know, I, I came across this story where a wife received $10,000 from her deceased husband's insurance policy, and so she's excited because she wants to move out of Harlem to a safer neighborhood and have a, a little place where she can have flowers and, and, and enjoy a, a different lifestyle. The daughter, she'd like to take the $10,000 and go to medical school because, you know, she wants to make something out of, of herself and get out of poverty. The, the son comes up and says, you know, if I had that money, I could invest it in this business and then I could take care of the entire family. And being the oldest in the family, he was able to sway his mom. Mom gave him the $10,000, and then immediately his business associate took the money and skipped out of town. The sister was livid with her brother for letting the family's hopes and dreams be shattered. She released a barrage of ugly words, a contempt that had no limits. And finally, she took a breath from all of this denouncing of her brother, and her mom stepped in and said, I taught you to love him. The daughter says, there's nothing to love in him. Mom says, there's always something to love. Have you cried for that boy today? I don't mean for yourself and the family because we lost all that money. I mean for him, for what he's been through and what it had done to him. When when do you think it's time to love somebody? When they're good and make things easy for you? It's when he's at his lowest and he can't believe in himself because the world done whipped him so. When you measure him, make sure you measure the hills and valleys before he got to where he is. And and, and, you know, don't we do that? We, We measure people, we judge people, we release words upon them, but but we haven't taken into consideration their journey, what they're dealing with, what, 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 what's going on in their life. And, and if you want to be honest, <clears throat> Jesus loves us when? At our lowest moments. Okay? Think of the woman at the well, the woman caught in adultery, the outcast lepers. In each case, these people were folks near the lowest point in their life. And what do they encounter? A God who loves them. You know, last night I was at a birthday party, and I'm talking to a woman who is a missionary, and she tells me about the terrorists who've been killing Christians in Mozambique and burning down the churches and just ravishing, you know, the families of these Christians. Well, a lot of these killers have been put into prison, and the the prisons are overflowing with, with all these killers. And I'm thinking to myself, good, and I hope the worst possible punishment is coming their way. I mean, you have to know that I pray for the persecuted church all the time. It bothers me that these people are are being persecuted so violently. Well, she continues on, but you want to know what's amazing? Is the Heidi Baker ministry, 
we now have Bibles and access to all these people in, in the prison so that we can bring the love of God to them. And the moment she says this, I'm like, oh, man, I've got to learn how to love people better. I focused on the offense and missed the opportunity to heal a broken soul. I mean, what did Jesus say? Father, forgive them. Well, they're killing him. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And friends, I believe one of our primary, well, the only commandment we have is to love people. We're here to learn how to love people better. 1 Peter 4.8 says, Above all, love each other deeply. Love covers a multitude of sins. Well, well, whose sins? Theirs or mine? Yes. Don't worry about it. You just get busy loving, and the Lord's going to take care of the rest. You see, when we're focused on loving others, that's when we get transformed. That's when God starts to do that new thing in us. You know, I read that <clears throat> there was a survey, an online survey of 18,000 people in 134 countries. 68% of the people's New Year's resolution was the desire for alone time. When asked which activities were, were most desirable, reading, being in nature, spending time alone, listening to music, being with friends and family was 12th on the list. In other words, people are desiring the spot where they can just be alone and do some thinking. And really, a lot of positive things happen when we get alone. And, and, and friends, you can see where I'm going with this. You're alone time with God. This is where new things are revealed to all of us. I mean, Jesus, it was his habit to, to go out to an isolated place to pray. He would often withdraw to a lonely place and pray. He once, once spent the whole night alone in prayer. Jacob got transformed with his, his solitary encounter with God. Moses used to get alone with God every day. Peter received the vision that all the Gentiles are supposed to meet Jesus. When? When he was alone in prayer. And, and this is essential for you and me to to get God's download on what he wants for our lives in 2020, what he wants to do in our ministry as a church, to be alone. In fact, you know, there's a famous passage where there's no vision that people perish, but when you study the passage closer, it says where there's no prophetic vision that people perish. And a prophetic vision is just this, a fresh word from God. And, and you know when you receive a fresh word from God? It's usually in your devotional life. When you spend time alone in his presence, you're opening his word, you're, you're talking to him, you're listening to him, he's interacting with your soul. And for you to have a devotional life, a quiet time, friends, this is the most important thing that I think you should be doing. It's going to show you how to love the people around you. It's going to remind you what your identity is and what it's not. It's going to bring to mind the fact that at all times you have the presence, the power, the love, the covering of God in your life. You know, these alone times, it could be when you get up before the rest of the family and have that personal conversation with God. It could be when you're stuck in traffic and you start getting frustrated. Or you could turn it into a prayer time. It could be when you're at work and you have to wait at those, those awkward times, opportunity for you and the Lord to have a conversation. Obviously, I want you to find a space in your house, your favorite chair, your favorite spot in nature where you and God meet. Because when you and God meet, something special happens. He promises to show up. And by the way, you're meeting with Almighty God. I had a cool experience. I told you last week that I had prayed in the sanctuary for Christmas Eve, and, and I felt the impression that the Lord was going to be in the rafters. And so I realized on Christmas Eve, I sang those Christmas hymns more fervently than I think I've ever sang in my life. Why? Because the Lord told me, I'm going to be in the rafters. He was in the room, and I wanted to make sure that I let him know how much I appreciated him, how much I love and adore him. 
Friends, this promise is made to you. When you get alone with him, you won't be alone because he's going to meet you there. Something special happens in this moment. You know, in the spiritual disciplines for the Christian life, Donald Whitney says this, without exception, the men and women I have known who make the most rapid, consistent, and evident growth in Christ-likeness have been those who developed a daily time of being alone with God. This is my prayer, my expectation, my request of you. You know, in 2020, it's an opportunity for the new you to arrive. And I want to close up with something that I put into your bulletins. A number of years ago, the actor Kirk Douglas was a guest on the Johnny Carson late night television show. And the two celebrities discussed the experience of being recognized everywhere they went and being pestered by people because of their fame. And then Kirk Douglas told the, about the time he was driving his car and he picked up a hitchhiking sailor. And the sailor opened the door and he saw the famous actor and he, his jaw dropped and he exclaimed, do you know who you are? And Kirk Douglas said it was a good question, one I've been thinking about ever since. Friends, we just finished the Christmas season where God explicitly told you who you are to him. And this leads us to the communion table. You see, sin was brought into the world. It, 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 it brought separation between us and God. It, it, it messed up the rhythm that we were supposed to enjoy with him. And so God stepped into the world to take upon himself everything that separated us from him and give to us unhindered access to his presence, his grace, his mercy, his love. And it all happened through Jesus who went to the cross made the exchange, our sins, for his righteousness. So now we can come and taste and see that the Lord is good. Let me tell you how communion works here in our church. You don't need to be a member here. You don't even have to be a Presbyterian. We merely ask that you embrace what Jesus did for you on the cross. And you experience this amazing love. We usually start from the back rows. We come forward, we take the bread, we dip it into the cup, and we receive it that way. If you're worried about the bread, we have gluten-free wafers. If you're worried about the, the cup, it's unfermented wine, so there's no problems there. We only ask that if you drop your bread in the cup that you don't dig around for it, okay? Just reach back and get a fresh piece. But most importantly, as you come forward to take communion the first Sunday of 2020, I want you to embrace your identity, the one commandment that he gave us, our one routine, time in his presence. Well, on the night in which our Lord was betrayed, he took the bread and first he blessed it and then he broke it saying, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner also we took the cup. And as he poured it, he said, this cup is the covenant of my blood shed for the remission of your sins. Drink ye of it and be thankful. Will the elders please come forward?